Hi, and welcome back to Old School. Today, we'll be talking about relationships in the emotional class, being human. Today, we welcome our teacher, Alex Jensen. Alex is the author of A Beautiful Season, Finding Your Identity in Christ After a Dating Relationship Ends. Someplace we've all been, I think. (laughs) Alex is a stay-at-home mom, author, blogger, and Christ follower. She is also an antiques dealer and sells vintage and antique decor online. I looked at the shop. It's adorable. You all need to go. Her love and passion is writing. She has authored several books, two that are published, A Beautiful Season, which we'll be talking about today, and The Meaning of Motherhood, Discovering Joy and Purpose Through Christ in the Everyday Moments of Mom Life. Alex has a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in math and science education, smarty pants. She (laughs) is a former elementary school teacher, and she and I follow one another on social media and have crossed each other's path, I think, as a divine appointment. So that's why we ended up here today. So welcome to class, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Um, my I intent think- with old school is to tell our stories and how we walked them and how we got to where we're at and how we get to get and maintain health in physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual areas of our life. And the reason I chose a beautiful season. I am a mom and the other, your other book sounds awesome too, but I find myself divorced and, um, and in back in the process, I've, I've walked the process of getting myself ready for the man God has for me, but we've all had those experiences of, um, what we thought were going to be forever's ending. Um, and so I just feel like even, everybody from 20 to 80 could benefit from some of what you found, some of what you've walked through and um, how you did come to finding your identity. And I know you don't, we're not going to go over the whole book because we don't have that kind of time, (laughs) but like an overarching, how you, how that first uh, ending started things off for you and how your walk has gone And then maybe we can talk a little bit more about, um, you know, getting through to the other side, if you will. Right. Okay. So it was not the best, the most wholesome, godly relationship. And I should have paid attention to the indicators that kind of clued me into, hey, this is probably not God's best, what's right for you. Um, My family didn't really approve of him or like him. Um, he wasn't a believer, which was, should have been the biggest red flag. Um, but at the time I was young and what I thought I was in love. And, um, so it was kind of hard coming out of that. I mean, we dated for two years in college and college, you just think that's the one and, you know, you're finally old enough. And, um, so coming out of that was really hard initially, um, lots of crying, um, crying out to God. I remember listening to a Sarah Evans song um, and just crying my eyes out. It, it talks about like a, a relationship ending. And that's kind of how I kickstart the book, me like listening to that song and just really like grappling with like strong emotions and um, but just leaning on the Lord through it. And um, time is of the essence time heals all wounds they say and it's really true but we have to seek god through that time and um seek other people we can't isolate ourselves or um wallow we have to kind of pull our self spy our bootstraps and rely on christ and reach out to people to help us along the way so that's kind of what the book's about um yeah just coming out of that in relying on Christ as my steady strength through what was a difficult time, but also a beautiful season being single presents so many opportunities to where you can just be, um, your true authentic self and be used by the Lord fully and wholly, um, without any, um, other obligations. So I'm married now and I have three little kids and, um, it's different than, when I was single and I could go on missions trips and, um, be parts of like sports leagues and, um, just by women's Bible studies in the evenings, like I can still do some of those things, but not all of them. You kind of have to pick and choose. So just really valuing that time of being single is important because it is a beautiful season. And I know when you're in it, it might not seem like 
the best season. There's definitely some longing through that season. Um, but it can, looking back, um, I wish I would have valued that time even more just knowing like, oh, this is just for such a short stint. And, um, yeah, I just encourage whoever's out there that's single and longing for a man or a woman in their life that they would just rely on Christ and take advantage of this time and travel and see the world and just do amazing things for Christ's kingdom. And that, I mean, I, I think everybody, for me, that hard first relationship, I was 16. I, I was, I did know the Lord. I had a relationship with the Lord. Um, but my entire life up to that point had been filled with various types of abuse and trauma. I was extremely vulnerable and naive. And um, as it turns out down the road, he was um, engaged to someone in Texas and, and was just poaching virgins is what I call it. And, um, and so, but all they had to say, and I, I joke with my daughter about this too, Mm -hmm. is that you can, um, you can get, uh, you know, into start to get into a relationship and think you have your, you know, like your decision-making process in place. But if you don't truly have like the foundation of of what you believe in regard to how a relationship go, should go, and like you said, seeing that first red flag that he wasn't a believer or whatever foundational thing, I think canceling somebody because of their height or their eye color, those are, you know, whatever. But in regard to those foundational deal breakers, but man, the first time you hear I love you, <laughs> I tell my daughter, whoop. <laughs> You. <laughs> so you, you can't wait until you hear that to decide, you know, this is how I'm going to, this is how I'm going to be, you know, or this is where I'm going to take my stand because you won't have a stand. You'll be jelly legs and you'll be just all Twitter hated like Bambi. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think there's some, um, some non-negotiables, but there's definitely a point where you need to like do away with the list of athletic, handsome, tall, um, because <laughs> <laughs> They're just not going to meet every single criteria. And you'd be amazed at what criteria is like you come to value about your actual um, person and um, just not like fully relying on that list, but just having a few character, some foundational non-negotiables um, for me, like that should have been like a avid believer. But um, I was just so naive at the time that Yes. Once you hear, I love you, it kind of just, you just melt inside and that's it. So (laughs) um. I'm, I'm forming a group, um, that we're going to, they're going to be an episode of my podcast, probably every other month. It's called let's meet. I'm in the mature season of life. And, um, I'm in a small group with my church that's over 45 singles. And so with a couple ladies, I'm forming this group. It's called let's meet. I like double entendre is there and we we're, we just want to get out there and there's a book by dr henry cloud called how to get a date worth keeping and he talks about a lot of components to like just get you out there to not get exclusive for six months to date a few people let them know that you expect them to do the same because we're not going to know if we're going to marry somebody on that first date and we need to not jump back into those old patterns and he talks about the list I believe that we should write a list. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I bring to the table. But on those superficial things that would be nice, but aren't mandatory, because how's that list been working for us? You know, we've ended up in bad relationships or I'm divorced. You know, how did that list work out for me before? So now I need to like set down and I don't really have a type. I, my, a couple of my two girlfriends that are doing this with me do. I, I want somebody to be healthy um, and in shape because that's what I work on for myself too. But I don't need them to be X height and this color hair or eyes or whatever it might be. But I do need them to have a similar faith worldview. I need them to be growing in the Lord and have that relationship. So those things. So I, I as I was reading through and you were talking about that, um, that's exactly it, that we want you know, young people to understand and actually older folks who are heading back out that this is how it should walk. And that way you're not ending up in the same way the first one did. So I'd like to ask so that 
people can understand also, okay, so you got the, I love you. You got stayed in the relationship despite of the, uh, of him being a believer, but what brought you to ending that? And it was you that ended it, correct? If I'm- it was me who ended yeah. it. And yeah. it was coming home for Christmas one year and I'm driving from Tulsa to, to Fort Worth and to see my family and he's not with me and he's not welcome. Um, with, with my family and just thinking, I don't, I don't want a relationship like this. Like this is not going to be for me in the long run. And while I knew it wasn't ideal, like just having gone through two years of that and then just finally realizing, um, just talking to God in the car and just having a moment with the Lord where it was like, this is not what I have for you, Alex. And I knew it was going to be the hardest thing that I had experienced up until that point in my life. And but just being obedient in that. And when you um, feel the Lord prompting you, like for whatever it is, it, it um, we need to listen and obey and just really listening to the Lord through that. So I, I don't want you to have drill down too deep because people can get your book and kind of see, but I personally believe if I'm in a room of a hundred people, that 90 of them have crossed my path some of them significantly the same, this type of abuse I've been through and the different, you know, and some of it is emotional. There was physical, there was sexual, there was emotional. Um, But I believe, honestly, there's probably a lot more people your age or that were your age when you were in that relationship that are truly going through exactly some of the things you were that ended up being why your family wasn't welcoming and what have you. Um, If you just could touch on a couple of those things that probably prompted you in the car to head in that direction. Right. Like Uh, how did you, you know, come to reconcile those things? Like some pretty severe fights and just where he was using language against me, like something you should just never say to anyone that that type of stuff is just um, it should be a deal breaker in a relationship because when you go into marriage, you're going to, you're going to fight and, have some arguments, but hopefully you can handle them in a healthy way to a point where, um, you're not just totally belittling that person and just, um, yeah. So just, I guess the level of of fights that we got in was just ridiculous. And, um, he and was over some manipulation though, too, right? Yes, a little there was narcissistic, that. a little manipulation yes, of trying to have, really and I believe there are a lot of relationships and like he that. isolated me kind of away from my friends and my family. That's another red flag. Um, like if, if that person's trying to isolate you and take you away from your friends and your family, like that should be a red flag. And that's what was going on as well. Um, and that's why it was going to be especially hard. To, to end things because he was all I had at that point. Um, other, other than my family, my family is amazing and they've always been there for me, um, no matter what, but just, yeah, there was going to, it was going to be a tough road. I've had a saying come to me since my divorce because my marriage was, had a huge controlling element and infidelity. Um, but there is worse than alone. And So as I head back out, I've walked through the healing process. My Lord is my counselor and my comforter. Um, But I, there are days when I'm praying and I think, Ooh, I'd really like that man that God has for me. I'd like somebody to share the remainder of my life with. And I do, I would like that. It is not to complete my happiness or complete me. I am happy and blessed and complete. They would just add to that. It would just be nice to have my person, but I also sit there and kind of freak out and probably (laughs) self-sabotage at the thought that maybe I pick wrong because there's worse than alone. There's ending up back where I was, or maybe there's even worse out there. So, you know, it's, it's a conversation that needs to be had. And I believe if people kind of listen to what you're talking about too, and we all did it in like our twenties, I totally did actually after the, my first really heartbreaking one, I kind of went on hmm, probably 10 years of thinking that if I didn't, if I, somebody got to the point where they said, I love you, I cut bait 
because I I was in control and I wasn't going to get hurt that way. Instead, it was all self-inflicted wounds and it was a mess until I came back to my relationship with the Lord. But I love that, how you talk about it, how you talk about those flags. You don't necessarily denigrate him or, you know, I mean, you just speak the truth. And I really believe that there are a lot of young people who maybe are in relationships like that, you know, the same with um, marriages that are um, on those paths, but people find it, like you said, you were going to be alone. So that's a big one. Or you walk, you go ahead and walk away. But I think you address this in the book too. Your the feelings that followed that almost drove you back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's definitely been were moments where I was like, did I make the right decision? It would be so nice to like be back in my comfort zone with this person. <laughs> and um, like I'm I'm so proud of myself that I was able to um walk away when I did and just really opening yourself back up, um, to another person. Like, I know what you said is, is true. Like there's worse than being alone. Um, but just, there are people who are good in this world. And my husband is like a testimony of that, who you can trust fully. And, um, like, I think I struggled with that a little bit in the early parts of our marriage, just thinking, can I trust this person? Because there was lack of trust going on in that unhealthy relationship. Um, and, um, just like you have to go in like fresh, clean slate and try not to take any of that luggage with you because I know like it, it's hard not to, but if you can, if you can just really go in with an open heart and mind and trusting God through that, um, that'll make your next relationship really healthy and God honoring. Yeah. I, I agree. I've Clearly, we, we we would have to struggle with um, kind of just correcting our own thought processes on trust, because if we think about it, this is how I feel about it. I didn't really consult the Lord about my husband before I married him, and he wasn't a believer before I married him. He came to be while we were married, and that relationship is between him and God. I'm not going to judge that. But I do not. And I'm writing a book, and it is kind of memoirish, and it goes through all the abuse. I don't believe that every man in the world is like all of the men that I have encountered and the things that have happened to me. I don't believe that. Um, The world would give me a pass to believe that they're all going to be that way and they're all going to treat me that way because every single one from my dad to my ex-husband did. But when I look at those, those were those relationships were happening out of brokenness and out of pain and not out of a true understanding from the Lord of who I was supposed to be with. And so I do believe that there are good men and there are men that aren't going to act like that and who will be a good spiritual leader for my home. Um, And I, so I don't put that on anybody. I never have. And, and, and that may have hurt me in some relationships because I just went right on in, but the Lord and I have dispensed with subtly. And my thought process now is that I believe you until you give me a reason not to. Now, mind you, if it's on something really serious or if we're on our third date and they're already, you know, breaking out a ring or, you know what I mean? You can, there are (laughs) things that kind of show that, well, okay, whoa, whoa, why are you in such a hurry? Or what are you hiding? Or, you know, stuff like that. Um, But overarching, I do believe that. And I think that is awesome that you have your husband and now a a great family and he's in there leading you uh, with a relationship with the Lord. And, and that's what I like about wanting to have you come on too. you, you, you walked it, you, you listened to the Lord and got out of that one. And then you move forward, you move forward in your healing, you talk about that journey. And I believe that people need to know, not churchy answers. And, and that bugs me because the counselors I had during my divorce, some were Christian, some were secular, and all of them gave not the best advice. I think people understanding truly that ultimately baseline is that we're listening to the Lord, that we have a relationship that's growing with him. And not even that it's growing in the form of dating or a mate, that it's growing for us. We need to come to the table, a whole person, a whole person that has a relationship with the Lord, not, you know, somebody who's trying to get another piece to put in the empty spot. And I feel like you talk a lot about that too. And for your young age, I think 
It's awesome. So I would like to know kind of like what was like a really, you know, light bulb kind of moment for you in regard to feeling like you were ready for the next guy. It was like I was at complete peace with where I was at. I wasn't, um, I didn't feel like something was missing. Like I won't say there wasn't still like a desire to be with someone, but it wasn't like something was like missing or wrong. It was just like, okay, I'm really enjoying my life right now. It would be nice and exciting if a special person came along um, to do life with me. But um, I think just um, trust, like, it was just kind of like this peaceful time, um, hence a beautiful season where was like okay I've reached this point now where it's like okay God is good life is good and um that longing was still there deep down but it wasn't just like constantly like chiding and yelling in the back of my mind like hey you need somebody so um and it took a while to get to that point it took like me stepping out of my shell I'm kind of Um, an extroverted introvert, if you will. I call Um, myself an introverted extrovert, but you know, tomato, tomato, that's what I understand. (laughs) Introverted extrovert. And um, just reaching out to to people, getting involved in like, um, I did a sand volleyball league. I joined a singles group through Life Church. Um, I, and that's actually how I met my husband. We met through a singles group. Oh, nice. And yeah, so I mean, that that's like a great way to plug in, but I did like a women's Bible study and made a lot of like good, wholesome girlfriends. And that's like really what you need during that time is friends who can uplift you and speak life into you and who are just like cheerleaders for you. Sure. And affirm, I mean, I, I'm older. (laughs) My friends tell me I'm not supposed to say that. And Bob Goff tells me I'm not supposed to call myself divorced. I'm supposed to call myself available. (laughs) Well, you look beautiful. I'm like, you look awesome. So <laughs> you're very sweet. So, but at this age, it's it is a little more difficult to find like organic kind of ways to meet someone. And I'm not down on dating apps. Dating apps um have a lot of junk, but so does I could meet somebody sitting next to me at church and they could lie to me. They could, you know, ha- not be a believer. My former pastor said you can go out and sit in the garage, but it doesn't make you a car. So just because somebody goes to church doesn't mean so you still need to walk that process. You still need to have, you know, a few months of dates and just kind of getting to know one another. Um, the five relationship bonds, you know, the first one is getting to know first before you go to trust, rely, commit, and then jumping into the physical, which is a thing. And a lot of Christians feel like at an older age, well, I've already had sex. So this is not a big deal. I don't have to hold off if I'm in a dating relationship. So all of these conversations about things that could snap off, um, you know, what the person God has for you, you could start to veer and go down the wrong, you know, go down a rabbit hole. Um, but being comfortable after my divorce, I was extremely, I was in pain, but I was extremely comfortable at the thought of not having another human being come in and break the peace in my home. My daughter even came to me and said, mom, this is the most peaceful it's been for a while. And I, I'm glad I, I hope you um, I want you to know, I think you're a good example of walking through this process. Um, so you, I agree fully. I don't have I don't need someone, but we were created for relationships. So I don't think it's bad that we desire someone. I think we just need to be careful that we don't desire so strongly that we go to the I love you and we're off. <laughs> <laughs> right. that you need somebody to like fill you fill a spot that only the lord can and right. yeah or complete us like jerry Maguire. Yes. you know i mean we don't we don't need that you know but uh the right person when they come 100 percent of them and you're 100 percent of you that's when it's great so how long after this breakup like was your husband the first person that you dated long-term after that? And how long was that after? It was about a year and a half after that um, we started, that we started dating. And yeah, so about a year and a half. Um, yeah, oh, which wow. is like a, a super long time, but it was long enough for me to kind of become myself again and make friends and um, get plugged in to different. Well, and you were making a concerted effort about it. If somebody wants to sit 
and lament and whine and maybe turn to, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll to just kind of try to assuage what they're feeling. Well, you're not going to heal and you're going to probably end up picking another one of the same off the buffet. (laughs) But the fact that you looked at it and drilled down and went straight to how do I heal from this? How do I recover from this without um, making a bad, another bad decision or not growing my relationship with the Lord, I think is a lesson for the ages. So I, I applaud you. And I think that's awesome. And I think that it's beautiful how the Lord rewarded you that way. I'm I'm not saying other people don't deserve the reward. So I don't want anybody to take this wrong. I'm just saying he rewarded your obedience with the person he had for you because you let him make you the person for him. And I think that's uh, my pastor said, and I'm probably going to butcher it. Um, uh, he was going on a relationship series talking about it. And he said, um, he was saying, what if God looked at you ladies? He was saying, I'm going to talk to the singles right now. What if a guy looked at you and said, you know, what if God brought you that man of your dreams, that guy you've been hoping for the guy that he has in mind for you. And he looked at you and said, you aren't the woman for me yet. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's like, okay, if you want this awesome Christian guy, you've got to be in the word and like preparing yourself and your heart. Um, yeah, you've got to kind of rise up to whatever, whatever person you're looking for. Be sure you're um, just being that person for that person. <laughs> right. It's only fair that you come to the table the same way. So I just feel that um, now, mind you, through COVID and stuff, I'm like, unless he's a he's a prime delivery guy, I'm not going to meet somebody. <laughs> but now, you know, so that's why I've created this little group. Um, I we're kind of each other's wingmen, if you will, and we're we're not, you know, our thought process isn't we're going to go to bars and pick someone up or what have you like that. We are looking at fun events and heading out like like you talk about in your book too. Yeah, yeah, I don't know at 60 that I'm going to go join a sports league. Although pickleball is pretty cool and that's kind of out there. But, you know, other things like the theater or going to some live music or concerts or whatever it might be, we're going to we're going to engage. We're going to go out and play golf. Um another friend I listened to a podcast and um some people on social media talks about how if you want a conservative guy and you go to the places where, you know, a man's man and a conservative guy go to those places. Like I would go to um, conservative functions or go to a gun club, <laughs> you know, or yeah. whatever, you know, I'm not going to go loiter around Home Depot, but I, you know, you get the gist is that they talk about that. And I think church is great, but not overarching church, not main, the main worship service, because I feel like it's, I'm trying to pick up like a meat market. And I just don't think that's the place to insert myself. But certainly through small group and those events, I, yes. I get it. And and I think at you guys age, that's perfect. And I think a lot of people do meet and marry through church that are a little younger. As you get older, it's harder to understand, you know, that dynamic without looking like a creeper. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, our um, life group, we were doing like life together, basically. So we were doing like all these fun, like going to concerts and doing um like uh, kickball. We also did kickball, kickball together, like kickball leagues. And so like, when I say I met him through a singles group, it's like, okay, we got to know each other well beyond outside of like the praise and worship setting. Um, so, yeah. and then you can see how people are and how, and that's why, uh, Dr. Cloud's book talks about that too, is he, he counseled somebody through dating and that's what the book walks through. And he tells them, you know, I, you cannot, Part of your contract with me is you cannot get exclusive for like the first six months. And I feel like I have less time in front of me than I do behind me. So I'm, you know, six months, but I mean, still it's good because what it does is it lets you see how they treat people. It's lets you get to a place where you are going to a family function and they're coming to your family function. And so you can get that better drill down. And so you were getting it through small group interaction and that's perfect. If that happens, then that's another organic way where you can just kind of get to know one another and then reach a point where, Hey, I'd like to date you. You know, I'd like, I'd like to find out more in this regard. Um, I think so many times people head out and on dating apps too, is they act like your first date is supposed to determine whether you'd marry this person. And, right. and he, Henry Cloud talks about that too. He says, 
you know, no, you um, look at it as an experience. You might get to the date and hey, you got a dinner out and they might teach you something you don't want. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so yeah. just getting out there and he calls it upping your numbers. So I think that's awesome. I think the routes that you talk about and how you talk about listening to the Lord to get extract yourself. We can't beat ourselves up for decisions that we made. They're done. But we can take a look at them and say, this is what the Lord would have me learn out of that. And here's what he'd have me learn going forward. And I think your book, Beautiful Season, it's backwards. Hopefully they can change it to mirror around when they edit me. <laughs> um, but I think it's awesome. And I, I really love, even at a young age, I told you before we started recording, I don't want to be condescending, but it's adorable. It's insightful for, you know, wise beyond your years. Um, the last question um, I asked this of all my uh, guests is what thing, I mean, and you're young, so I don't know how much life you have to draw, but what thing would you want others to know that you wish, you know, someone had maybe modeled or told you? There, oh, wow, there are. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be just one, but I was just kind okay. of like that, you know, that favorite nugget maybe, because we all tend to have at least one. At least one. Um, well, I'm going to share my favorite scripture. Um, okay. It's um, First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. Be joyful always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. So just if we can learn to be content in whatever season or circumstance we're in currently, then that's going to really aid us for future seasons. So whether you're single or married or you have a bunch of little kids just trying um, to rely on God and be content in that season is really going to aid you in what's coming next. And if you can learn to be content now, then next season, you're going to more than likely be a content person and just um, the Lord's able to change the perspective of our circumstances when we rely on him through the word. Um, I know, Michelle, that you mentioned that you like to have daily quiet times and I do as well. And that just really kind of helps me to rely on God and to be a, a content person and, and at peace with Jesus. So um, that's kind of my little nugget of wisdom, something from the Bible. Hey, that's a great nugget because no, none of us uh, come out of the shoot content. In fact, when we're little, we're a little narcissist, but, you know, as we're growing and we're learning that, you know, where we're at to be content in the blessings we've already received and not requiring one additional thing to be at peace or to be happy or, or putting that on another human being, which is what we get into when we start looking into relationships. It is not somebody else's job to make you happy. Um, they can add to your happiness, but it's not somebody else's job And that. And being content is a big deal. And at the, your age to already be acquiring and, you know, and managing your contentment, um, it, you know, just growing into it is, is a beautiful thing. And I think that's incredible advice. So I really appreciate that. Um, I thank you so much for being our teacher today. And uh, thank you everyone for coming to class. If you want to get any of Alex's books, I'll have all of those links in the uh, show notes and her other links on social media. If you'd like to follow her, she has other uh, connections. Uh, you have a blog. Yes. 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 AlexandraJensen.org. And so you can connect with her blog and you need to go look at her antique store because it's absolutely adorable. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, thank you for coming today. If you'd like to connect or engage or interact with the show or um, me, my connections will be in the show notes as well. I'd appreciate you listening and giving a review. And um, I love to get any uh, engagement. So if you want to email me at Michelle uh, at michellevrabel.com, that would be awesome as well. I would love to chat with you or uh, point you in whatever direction. If I've said something, if I've referenced a book or a person and you'd like to get that information, I'd be happy to do that too. So I want to thank you for coming to class and class dismissed. Dismissed.